You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta and part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Grant McCauley, Jake Mastriani with you after what was a bit of an emotional roller coaster of a weekend for the Atlanta Braves. We'll start with the good. They swept the defending National League champion Arizona Diamondbacks in a three-game series. They did it in dramatic fashion on Friday, as we talked about. Then again, with a big comeback on Saturday. Jake, I know you were in the house for that as well as I. And then on Sunday, they finished it off behind Chris Sale and some timely home runs. So some good stuff that was going on for the Atlanta Braves over the weekend on the field, except for the Spencer Strider news that we covered on Friday. We have a little bit more as far as details on that. We're going to talk about that on the show. Go through Sunday and Saturday's games, and of course, get you set for the four-game series against the New York Mets that is coming up. Uh, Leave us those likes and comments. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta right here on YouTube. We appreciate that. And if you like the show, be sure to share it with a friend. And subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Today's episode brought to you by Prize Picks. Download the app today. Use the code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match of up to one hundred dollars. That is promo code Locked On MLB in the Prize Picks app. Well, Jake, we knew that there was going to be some bad news as far as Spencer Strider missing significant time. That is kind of what is the backdrop of this weekend. But I got to tell you, what happened on the field very encouraging from the Braves bats, and I think what we saw from Chris Sale on Sunday to let you know maybe things are going to be okay for this club, even if they have to overcome that adversity yet again. Yeah, sweeping the defending National League champion should be a headliner over a weekend, but obviously with what happened to Spencer Strider, that's what's on a lot of people's minds right now. But again, it shouldn't be overlooked what this Braves team did against a really good Diamondbacks team, which I came away with really impressed in this series, despite them getting swept. Uh, and I think that says a lot about this Braves team, too, and what they were able to do. So I thought it was really two really good teams. And I thought the Braves just really battled those first two games to come back. And as you mentioned, Chris Sale did a really good job on Sunday when the Braves needed it, too. Were able to get just enough runs to get the win. Yeah, they were. And they were able to get some timely home runs as well. We were wondering, when are the Braves going to start hitting the balls over the wall? They're leading Major League Baseball in doubles. But you expect some of those to turn into home runs. This was a fairly good weekend for that. And the Braves and their potent offense is the only team in Major League Baseball still batting 300 or better. They are at 300 on the nose. Let's talk a little bit about Sunday first here because I do want to get into some of the good that happened on the mound. I know it was a mixed bag for Max Fried on Saturday. I'll get to that in a moment, but your impressions of Chris Sale, I felt like it was more the same of what we saw from Philadelphia. Five and a third innings, two-run ball, no walks, six strikeouts for Sale. He gets backed up by some big home runs. Matt Olson, uh, Michael Harris to put the Braves ahead. Austin Riley, good to see that late, but on the mound, it's that's, I think, where you want to see the tone be set, especially on a weekend in which you lose your top starting pitcher, your ace, your other ace, has some trouble in the first inning. I think they just needed a quiet, early, you know, it's just settling in from their starter to help set the tone for that Sunday win. It's crazy to think about. I mean, coming into the year, like you said, you got your two aces in Strider and Freed, who you feel like you're going to be, you know, kind of your your bench guys, your glue guys at the top of the rotation. Yep. But it's been Sale and Morton here early on that have kind of had to steady the ship while Strider obviously dealing with injury and Max Freed getting off to a bit of a slow start. So I don't think it, the beginning of his Braves tenure couldn't have gone much better for, again, just what the Braves needed at this point from Chris Sale. And I thought everything looked good. I mean, he got 27 foul balls in this game, and that really drove up the pitch count, so he wasn't able to go too deep into the game, but still worked into the sixth inning, got through Corbin Carroll again for a third time. So we're able to to give the Braves some length again, and they needed it uh, with some of the shorter outings that they've had, which is going to be typical early in the season. You're not going to let pitchers go 100, 110 pitches at this point in the season anyway, so you're going to have to rely on that bullpen been a good thing for the Braves but as for sale being 13 whiffs 45 or 54 swings just a 24 percent whiff rate I mean that's really good I I expect better from Chris Sale going forward just because I think that much of him but again that goes back to what I said earlier I credit that Diamondbacks lineup that I think is a very pesky team I think they have very good at bats they're a very good two strike team which we can talk about more when we get Max Freed's outing but overall Chris Sale I mean the stuff looks sharp the velocity was even up a little bit in this one so uh, I mean, he is, he's been what I thought he would be. I was very excited and happy for Chris Sale coming into the season. I still think there's top of the rotation stuff in there when he is healthy. And right now he looks healthy and he looks really, really good. 
Yeah, I mean, if Chris Sale is your middle of the rotation starter, even with the Spencer Strider news, I think you're okay with that. Now, everybody's going to move up a slot, obviously. And there are, I think you're right on the money with more of an expectation for a guy with the pedigree of Chris Sale. If he does get himself healthy, he's got some tread on the tire, I believe, because as much as you can talk about some of the injuries and clearly the Tommy John surgery, it's his own thing. Some of the stuff he dealt with in Boston over the last couple of years in particular was a little bit more on the fluke injury side. So if anything, it might have kind of helped to, you know, maintain a little bit more as he comes over to the Braves rather than being taxed for that 160, 180 or more innings that he might have normally been throwing, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, that's going to be something, you know, to watch, obviously, is how are the Braves going to manage that innings? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're already down one starter. We are assuming for the rest of the year in Strider, and uh, Max Fried had his own injury issues last year. So what are you going to do with Chris Sale? How are they going to manage that? I think, you know, for right now, you're just going to play it start by start. But, I mean, he hasn't had a lot of workload the last several years, but he is somebody that in his past for a long stretch was able to throw a lot of innings. But I think that's definitely one of the key things to watch with Chris Sale and hopefully this bullpen stays as good as it has been early on mm-hmm. but five five plus innings and you get to the bullpen I mean I think that's perfectly fine for somebody like Chris Sale and it could be a way to kind of limit his workload as well but that's certainly going to be something to watch throughout the season how they manage that that's something I've talked a lot about is the fact that yes you do have 40 year old Charlie Morton you do have Chris Sale coming off injury but when you load up a bullpen the way that the Braves have with some really capable options both righty and lefty guys that you trust in leverage situations far before you get to the ninth inning, you feel pretty good with this offense, and we saw it in the series. They're going to get you some runs if the bullpen can do its job, and boy, did that group do its job. 13 and two-thirds scoreless innings for the series, Jake. I mean, that is some serious work by this Braves bullpen. I saw Joe Jimenez on Sunday look about as good. I know he was great in the second half last year for the Braves once he kind of found that velocity after the offseason back procedure, but he looked dynamite in this game. That might have been my biggest takeaway from the bullpen on Sunday is Joe Jimenez. And I think that bringing him back on that multi-year deal tells you all you need to know. The Braves believe in this guy. He went out there and did some serious work, as I posted on social media. Him and, and, and Pierce Johnson as well. I mean, the two guys they got last year, obviously Jimenez signing or trading for, before the year, and Pierce Johnson trained the deadline, then they re-signed both of those guys in the offseason. Pierce Johnson getting the save on Sunday with Rysel Iglesias down and he was fantastic. He, I mean, 15 pitches, 13 of them curveballs. It's one of those pitches you just know it's coming, and hitters really can't do much with it. But Joe Jimenez, talk about a guy who, when he did come over, like everybody loved Justin Henry Malloy. He was maybe one of the Braves' top prospects at the time in a very weak system, and they gave up a lot of years of a, a promising player to get you know, one year of Joe Jimenez. It turned into more than that with him getting re-signed, and it was a shaky start with the Atlanta Braves. Coming off the back injury wasn't – you know, particularly great at the beginning of last year, but you're right. Once he turned it on, they saw the guy they traded it for. And look, he's not getting those, what most people would consider high leverage situations in the seventh, eighth inning. A lot of those are going to mentor. They're going to Pierce Johnson, but that's a that sixth inning. Like we talked about with maybe starters not going quite as long. It's become a key moment in the game for a lot of these Braves games. And you look at this game in particular, Sale came out to get the lefty, and then you had the middle of their lineup coming up, three righties, and you're able to go to a guy in Joe Jimenez, who, again, like you said, and I believe Snicker said it as well, that it was the best that he has seen Joe Jimenez in a Braves yeah. uniform. And he has certainly done that for the Braves, and it's ended up being a really huge move for them, not just trading for him last season, but then just bringing him back. Yeah, inning and two-thirds scoreless for Joe Jimenez, as you mentioned. Nice to have Chris Sale, situational lefty, get Corbin Carroll to start the sixth inning. That was then the day for him. And then Tyler Matzik, a scoreless frame. Pierce Johnson, a scoreless inning. I know you brought him up earlier. I don't want to you know, overlook what the other two guys have done and what many guys in this bullpen have did uh, over the course of the first week plus and, and, of course, in this series over the weekend. But nice to have a guy like Pierce Johnson if you need someone to come in and close for you. You know, A.J. Mentor's done it before as well, and there's a couple of other guys that might get that chance. But Johnson, who was kind of the closer for Colorado, before being traded over to Atlanta at the deadline last year. A nice backup when Rice Iglesias is thrown in a couple of days, and you just kind of like to stay away from him if possible. Yeah, certainly just one of those situations where you had to use Iglesias back-to-back days. Or I guess you didn't have to use him a couple of days ago, but you did, uh, just because he hadn't had a lot of work with the two off days. That kind of threw some things off. But it's nice yeah. to have – I mean, you, you could have used Pierce Johnson, obviously. You know, maybe Mentor wasn't available. He could close games out. I mean, there's a lot of guys in this bullpen – 
that can close games out if needed to. One thing on Pierce Johnson, just a quick note I heard from CJ on the telecast. He talked about the ground ball rate for Pierce Johnson mm-hmm. when he was in Colorado. I want to say it was somewhere in the 20 percentile. And since coming over to the Braves, it's more in the 50 percentile. And obviously the Braves have focused more on that curveball and he's throwing yeah. a lot more. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's one of those things. Alex Anthopoulos, that front office, you know, they look at all of these things with these players when they're acquiring them and they have plans for what they can do with these guys, including Jared Kelnick, who had uh, another big part of the offense again on Sunday. Yeah, we'll get to Jared Kelnick a little bit later, but to button up that Pierce Johnson in the bullpen, you know, conversation, I talked to him at the end of last year, right before the postseason, and just kind of asked him, like, what's this first couple of months been like? He was like, well, you know what I found out is I'm actually a ground ball pitcher because the Braves had him throwing that curveball a little bit more, and he had a very good fastball, and everything's going to move better outside of Coors Field. So Pierce Johnson, another member of that Braves bullpen who has an important role to play, and he did so by picking up his first save of the season as the Braves grabbed that 5-2 win on Sunday. They won in 9-8 comeback fashion. We'll get into a little more of that and, of course, the Max Fried discussion as we roll on here on the Braves postcast. And we'll get you set for what should be a fun series with a Hank Aaron tribute on Monday, a familiar face on the mound for a familiar foe as the New York Mets are going to roll into town for a four-game series. That's all next on the Braves postcast. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including uh, popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, Veggie, and Vegan as well. Also, discover more than 60 add-ons every week like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, beverages, all these things to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and fuel up for your springtime goals. Head on over to factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50. Use the promo code locked on MLB 50. You get 50% off your first box plus 20% off of your next box. That is code locked on MLB 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on MLB 50 to get your 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box box while your subscription is active. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. Spring training is over. Baseball season is officially underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less than add them to your prize picks entry today. Download the app, use the code locked on MLB, and for a first deposit match of up to $100, that's locked on MLB in the prize picks app. Well, Jake, it was quite the weekend for the Atlanta Braves in this sweep, and the comeback win on Saturday, 9 8, the final score. They didn't have to wait till the ninth inning to finish it off. That had a little bit of everything offensively, but one guy who was right in the middle of it, who had himself a very nice week, is Marcelo Zuna. And what a difference a year makes. We saw what he did once he got hot in May last year, but it was about this time a year ago that we were talking about, you know, the possible departure of Marcelo Zuna because he just really might not have a spot on the roster. Things have definitely changed in that regard. Great start for him. He already has four home runs after a big three-run blast that helped get that Braves rally started on Saturday. We talk about Ronald Acuna Jr. for good reason, Matt Olson, Austin Riley, Ozzie Albies. Sometimes it seems like Marcel is kind of in the background, but it looks like he might be up to big things again in 2024. You're right. It's crazy here a year ago, well, maybe a little bit more into April, but still fans were wondering when are they going to let him go? And now here we are thinking they got to pick up that $16 million team option yeah. for next year. It seems like a no brainer and we'll see a lot of season left. Things can happen. Certainly we saw last year, things changed quickly for him uh, on the good from the bad to good. But right. Ozuna, I mean, four home runs already hitting 314. I-, I talked about it last year and I think it still applies this year. It's, the difference in Ozuna, it's just, it's a more all around game. It's not, Yes, right now he's still getting a lot of the power. He's got four home runs, but you know he's given you – he's taken some walks. He's taken his hits the other way, and that's really, to me, is the big difference from the Marcel we saw for nearly two-plus years going into last season and the Marcel we saw you know, from May on last year and now to start this season. It's just he's become more of a complete offensive player. It's not just boom or bust when he's up there, and that's why he's just become so – Uh, such an effective piece and part of this lineup. And you're right. He does get overlooked with the things that Riley Olsen, Acuna, all these, all those great all-stars hitting in front of him do, but he is certainly right there, especially to begin this year, leading the charge. 
Yeah, and that Michael Harris guy is also pretty good. I mean, that, that's the crazy thing about this Braves offense. And you and I have talked about this a lot, and this is our third year of doing this. You're not just counting on one or two guys to come in and get the big hit to start a rally, to finish a rally, to put the exclamation point on a huge inning. It could literally be just about anyone, one through nine, in this lineup. It was the bottom of the fifth on Saturday. The three-run homer made it from an 8-2 game to an 8-5 game. It just got the Braves back into it. Matt Olson with an RBI single. Michael Harris, an RBI single. Ronald Acuna Jr. then ties it up. Austin Riley unties it. That happening in the bottom of the eighth inning. So it was literally just about every one of the heavy hitters, if you want to call them that, of the Braves' order. And that just speaks to how good this lineup is. They now have 13 home runs on the season. The major league leader is 15 as far as teams are concerned. 27 doubles for this club already, most in baseball. And again, as I said earlier, the only team in baseball still batting 300 is the Atlanta Braves. Texas Rangers right behind them at 298. But either way, I think we've seen what the Braves offense can do, averaging seven runs per game over the first eight, uh, excuse me, first eight games as well. So a lot of good things happening offensively. Unfortunately for Arizona, they had a lot of good things happening offensively in the first inning on Saturday against Max Fried. I don't think that this is going to be a regular occurrence where Max Fried is feuding with the first inning all year long, but there had to be some frustrations in there, some well-placed hits, a couple of hard-hit balls as well. Cattell Marte was certainly doing his thing against Spencer Strider and Max Fried in this one, but you got to give credit to the Arizona lineup. It looks like they're going to be a very difficult group for opposing pitchers to deal with. Max Fried got a first-hand look at it in another rough first inning for him. And like I said, this was this was a series. I know the Braves swept the Diamondbacks, but I was really impressed with that Diamondbacks lineup. And I think when they get healthier in the starting rotation, Eduardo Rodriguez, Jordan Montgomery comes back, all of that. You got Gallon and, and Kelly, who the Braves yeah. fortunately missed in this series. I think this is going to be a really good team again in a tough division out there in the NL West. But for Max Fried, look, he, he didn't he didn't get a chance to work out of these things in that first outing because, you know, he had to come out in the first inning after only two outs. And it just felt to me like he was still struggling with that command. The only difference in this one was he was throwing strikes. Mm -hmm. They were just too good of strikes, especially early on. I mean, he left one over the plate to Marte, and Marte is absolutely hot to begin the season and a really good hitter anyway. You know, he left a hanging curveball up to Christian Walker as well. And then he had a couple of, of, of you know, Tough hits as well. 69 mile per hour ball that just sneaks right in the infield that Ozzy gets and just can't do anything with and just mm -hmm. some stuff like that as well. But overall, as the outing got on, if you want to look optimistically, I, I think he did get a lot better and he should have pitched four more scoreless innings after that. He had the error in the fifth inning of what should have been a pretty easy double play turn. Mm -hmm. Ozzy just whiffs on the catch at, at second base. But, you know, like I said, you want to try to, to look going forward. I, I thought there were some steps after really those first four batters again i know the inning continued beyond that but some of it was just some some batted ball uh, yeah. luck not going his way and i thought he threw the ball much better so we're going to see we're going to see uh, max freed get that era below 18 uh, i can almost guarantee you that's going to happen uh, but still just seems like he's working through some early season struggles right now and again hopefully what transpired after that first inning uh, on saturday mm -hmm. he'll carry over to his next start yeah, I will say this. Not too many times will you give up seven earned runs and see your ERA be cut more than in half, but that was the case for Max Fried. It went from 40.50 to 18, as you just mentioned. And yeah, the uh, other couple of runs that were scored against him in the fifth inning should have gotten through that frame as well. The error did not help with that. So seven earned of the eight overall, the Diamondbacks hung on him. So all eight of their runs against Max Fried, four and a third innings, 10 hits, only the one walk, the leadoff home run, five strikeouts. I did feel like he started to kind of find it. The fifth inning was just the kind of trouble that once you've already had a six run first inning, it's just going to make the start look altogether worse, but hopefully he'll be able to get himself kind of back on the right track. Because at this point, Jake, when we talked about Chris sales performance on Sunday, uh, Charlie Morton, we'll talk about a little more later. Reynaldo Lopez goes from being your fifth starter to your de facto four. At this point, you're going to need Max free to step back into that leader of the rotation that he's been for so many years for this team. Yeah, he has to at this point. I mean, with the way that, that things are going right now, I mean, it's great that Sale's done what he's done and, and Morton looked good in his first outing and Lopez as well. But uh, Max Fried is your ace at this point. Again, assuming Strider's not going to be back this season, you really got to count on Max to lead this thing. Yeah, you do. And Strider officially placed on the injured list on Sunday. Going to get that second opinion. The Braves called it a UCL sprain, but as we know with a sprain, 
And that's a little bit more than what you might be thinking about. Oh, I sprained my ankle. I'll be back in a week or two, even if it's a bad one. That's not really the way UCL sprains work. It is going to be, as they said, UCL damage. That's going to be time on the shelf, significant time on the shelf. And we'll find out more from the Braves over the next few days. Uh, as we continue, we'll talk a little bit more about a couple other Braves who have had themselves a very nice homestand thus far. And hopefully they'll carry it on over to the series against the New York Mets, the four gamer that will get started soon. We will talk about that as the Braves postcast continues. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, that you can still have an IRA? That's what our sponsor, Robinhood, is here to tell you all about. It's the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on that 3% match as well. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with that 3% match. The offer good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info, claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Let's talk a little bit about the four-game series that's coming up and put a bow on what was a good weekend for the Braves. You brought up Jared Kalnick's name earlier, Jake. We got to talk about him. He's now hit safely in seven of the eight games that the Braves have played. The only one he didn't, he came off the bench, drew a walk, and found his way on base. He has done that quite well. Uh, this, I think, is a little bit more indicative of the hard work that he put in in the spring. I'm not here to tell you that he's going to bat 575 or 600 or whatever it's been throughout the course of the weekend. But when you're thinking about the first impression and how you wanted to get your season started, it couldn't have gone much better for Jared Kelnick thus far. Yeah, to come in in a home opener, get a, 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 a line drive double, if you want to call it that, in the first game to tie things up. That's how it goes down in the book. But yeah. what a you know what a start that he's been off to. And I think something that's maybe a little telling, he got him in bat against the lefty late in the game on Sunday yeah. as well. Now, he did strike out in that at bat, um, but had some good swings in there, too, before striking out. But maybe that's a little bit telling. I th still think Duvall is going to get his at-bats against lefty starters. But I think that's just, you know, again, a, a little nod to the way that he's played early on in the season and how good he's looked and the impact that he's having at the plate. Uh, certainly a great start for Kelman. Yeah, and I think Duvall will get some of that same courtesy. It's not going to be like every time there is a pitching change that you'll want to go ahead and pinch hit. The game situation, I think, might dictate it more than anything. But, yeah, Jared Kelnick has certainly learned – or, excuse me, earned the opportunity – to get those chances, another hit in his first at bat on Sunday, and that came on the heels of having three hits in four trips to the plate as well on Saturday. So some pretty impressive work over the weekend for Kelnick, who continues to contribute at the bottom of the order. And I know we talked about Michael Harris and what he can do and what he's doing this year, even though he's not in that spot. But it seems like the Braves have something magic going on down in that ninth spot of the order that about 29 other clubs would like to find a way to replicate Maybe it's having somebody hit in front of Ronald Acuna Jr. as well. I mean, I think that has a lot to do with it, hitting in front of Ronald. And certainly we've talked about it, you know, whether it's been Arcia, Von Grissom, Michael Harris has spent time in that nine spot over the last several years. And it feels like when they're there, they're typically on. So it's been a really lucky spot in the Braves lineup. Yeah, Braves will look for more of the same from their offense as they welcome a club that has had more questions than answers in 2024 and that would be their NL East rival, the New York Mets. It's a four-game series that starts on Monday. Of course, the Braves and the Mets, well, they had themselves quite a rivalry a couple of years ago. There was no encore of that in 2023 as the Mets really had some struggles. They are just three and six on the year as they come into Truist Park for the first meeting between these two teams. Uh, obviously, as the Braves are looking to get their rotation set up, we know who's going to start the first couple of games, Charlie Morton, then Reynaldo Lopez, a question mark on Wednesday. Max Freed set for Thursday. And on the flip side of that, the first pitcher the Braves are going to see in a New York Mets uniform this year, our old friend Julio Tehran. That is going to be a little bit strange. It will be a little bit strange seeing him in a Mets uniform pitching in Atlanta against them. Uh, obviously loved Julio in his time here, always rooting for him, except for on Monday night. Um, pretty much every other time now that he pitches for the Mets. But will be an interesting matchup there. The Mets last Tyler McGill to injury already. 
as they got some, you know, they're out with uh, Sango's out still right now for the mm-hmm. Mets. So they had to call, call on Julio Tehran here to try to get them some innings. He threw some good innings for the Brewers last year as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's still a veteran pitcher. He knows how to pitch, uh, but we'll see if the Braves are able to get after him. Yeah, not a bad spring for the Orioles, but didn't make their big league club. Wanted to find himself an opportunity. And as we know, with injuries, you never know what club could you know find a use for you. And the New York Mets have needed to figure that out. A couple of pitchers they were counting on this year are now hurt. And of course, there's no DeGrom, no Scherzer, no Verlander. They're trying to kind of reinvent things up there in Flushing. And it's going to be a little bit difficult, I think, as we've seen in the early going of the season. On the mound for the Braves is right-hander Charlie Morton, who looked terrific against the White Sox in his first start of the year. I've talked to a lot of Braves pitchers, you know, and they all say the same thing when asked about Charlie Morton is they want to figure out what he's done to be as good as he is at 40 years old because Charlie in his late career renaissance, I think uh, has inspired quite a few other pitchers to want to see if maybe they can pull that off. Yeah, I don't know if that's quite as easy for everybody as it is for Charlie Morton, who makes it look pretty easy going out there. I mean, the one thing we know with Charlie, every time he goes out, he's got some issues with commands. He'll walk some batters. He might hit a lefty on the back foot mm-hmm. with that curveball, but he has that swing and miss stuff every time that he's out there. And the Braves need him, as we've talked about throughout this postcast. And Braves are counting on a 35-year-old sale who's been injured a lot. They're counting on a 40-year-old in Charlie Morton. But we've seen it the past two years. Maybe he hasn't been that top of the rotation guy that Braves fans are, are hoping for or still wanting, but he still gives you a chance to win just about every time he goes out. He does, and that's what the Braves need. And as you mentioned with that bullpen, if he can give them that five or six quality innings, let the offense do its work, you've got the arms behind him that can help turn it into wins. Game one is Julio Tehran against Charlie Morton. That's a 721st pitch on Monday. Then it will be Adrian Hauser and Reynaldo Lopez in game two. Mets will send Jose Quintana to the mound on Wednesday. I guess we could talk about this now. Alan Winans was called up from AAA Gwinnett as kind of the first you know, line of defense with Spencer Strider placed officially on the injured list on Sunday. Uh, a few of the arms the Braves might have looked to, especially in the case of A.J. smith Shaver, maybe not quite ready. And maybe it's just about figuring out how to get through this turn and then have your longer term plan come along. Because I got a hard time believing, Jake, that Bryce Elder is not going to get a crack at helping the Braves to fill that rotation need. Yeah, somebody's Strider in particular is going to be out for a long time. It's it's hard to believe, like you said, that Elder's not going to come in to fill that role or at least get the first shot at. I think Winans is here, maybe in just case they need a long guy over these mm-hmm. next couple of games, mm-hmm. and then I wouldn't be surprised if you know maybe he gets a start, like you said, to try to get through the rotation this time. But then Bryce Elder uh, gets called up. It's a long stretch of games the Braves have right now to get through without an off day, so um, they're going to need obviously some arms to help them get through it. You had some shorter outings for both Strider and Freed as well to kind of tax the bullpen. So you just needed a fresh arm out there and Winans to help give you some innings. Look, for Winans last year, he had one terrific start against the Mets, and he had one really bad start against the Mets. So if he does have to pitch against them in this series, there is at least some history of success there for him. And, of course, he was a former Met farmhand, so I'm sure he still has that in the back of his mind somewhere. The finale of the series is a 12-20 business person special on Thursday. Max Freed will get that start against Luis Severino, who has moved across town after pitching for the New York Yankees. Just another, uh, I guess, option that the Mets are exploring to see if they can figure out how to fill their rotation. Had some success, some very good success with the Yankees, but injuries had kind of derailed him as it went along. You mentioned with the Braves and their schedule, they have this four-game series against the Mets coming off the three against the Diamondbacks. Then they will head to the Miami Marlins for three, and then out to Houston for three against the Astros. So they are in quite a run here are the Braves of uh, games that they've got to figure out a way to get through. Offensively, I think they're good. Bullpen-wise, I think they're good. The rotation, though, we're going to start to find out how exactly they want to fill that need and how exactly they're going to deal with the Houston Astros in particular. That should be an interesting matchup, and of course, we'll get there down the road. Yeah, it will be. It's a long stretch. you got some tough games as well on the road. Uh, Miami Marlins have won their first game so maybe they're starting to heat up a little bit so maybe that series becomes a little bit more challenging they may actually get some pitchers back here pretty soon too to help them out but obviously going and facing uh, the astros is going to be a tough series so uh, it's going to be a long stretch for the braves and they got to try to figure this out on the mound what they're going to do but as we mentioned i got to imagine bryce selder is going to get inserted into this rotation at some point yeah and we'll see how the braves address that when they address that but they are going to have to figure some things out without spencer strider for a little while That brings us to the end of this edition of the Braves postcast as we have wrapped up what was a pretty good weekend for the Braves with the sweep. The bad news of Spencer Strider, though, kind of tempers that just a bit, but Atlanta will look to get back on the winning track again, keep this thing going, 
win the first of four against the Mets on Monday with Charlie Morton against Julio Tehran. Make sure that you're subscribed to Locked On Sports Atlanta here on YouTube and to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast because you will get the audio version of every postcast plus all the great stuff that Jake has for you all season long. Make sure that you are riding along with us this week. We'll have much more to come and the Hank Aaron special, the celebration of the 715th home run 50 years ago Monday. We'll be talking all about that as well on the next edition of the Braves postcast. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, so long, everyone.